Growing up in the 90s and 2000s, whenever I sat in front of the TV and saw that logo and heard that intro, I knew I was about to be amazed and thrown into wonderful and designed worlds with characters you can only love. Disney played a significant role in bringing joy into my life. Be it the funny interactions between Tarzan and Jane trying to <clears throat> communicate for the first time. <laughs> Such right. Huh? Or seeing this bombshell of a woman, Meg, making me and my boy Hercules seem like even bigger idiots than we already are. And although Disney surely started losing its magic a few years ago and decided that showing people slowly overcome their flaws and trying to be better people has become way too boring for the loyal audiences, I still look back to those good old days fondly. Now, Instead, they punish us with scenes that arouse our jealousy of the blind that don't have to endure such torture methods. Seeing an oversized screen woman shaking her CGI-given booty to a song of a tasteless rapper while complaining about not being taken seriously by her male colleagues may seem bizarre enough. But there is also something even more sinister. It's the Mickey Mouse gas mask designed for children during World War II. And the reason behind this design choice is indeed a tragic one, and it will shock you to discover how gas masks in the Second World War killed more people than they saved. In 1934, the British government decided that it was possible that over the next few years it would become involved in a war with Nazi Germany. During the First World War, several countries, including Germany and Britain, had resorted to chemical warfare. This included chlorine, phosgene and mustard gas. The government feared that the enemy would use aircraft to drop chemical bombs on civilians. Therefore, the British government asked its scientists at the Port and Down Laboratory to design a civilian respirator, which could be mass-produced at a unit cost of two shillings. The result was the general civilian respirator. In 1936, a disused mill in Blackburn became a gas mask assembly plant where by 1938 more than 30 million gas masks had been manufactured. Production has already begun in the new government respirator factory in Blackburn and soon they will be turning them out at the rate of half a million a week. Mr. Geoffrey Lloyd, Under Secretary for Home Affairs, opening the factory, said that in the event of war gas masks would be issued free by the government. To show how simple it is, Mr. Lloyd himself put on one of the masks. On September 3rd, 1939, the envisioned nightmare became a reality. Britain declared war, along with France, Australia and New Zealand on Nazi Germany. The responsibility lies on the shoulders of one man. By his latest act of naked aggression, Hitler has committed a crime not only against Poland, but against the whole human race. Against the mothers and children leaving the cities of Britain under the great evacuation scheme, with a smoothness and speed that avoids a single accident or delay. As they start out on what to them is the great adventure, already German troops, guns and planes have crossed the Polish border to kill and to destroy. So Britain prepares to fight, and never in our history have we been so united in the knowledge that our cause is just. We have no material interest in the quarrel between Germany and Poland, but we shall be fighting for something which is vital to our life and to the life of all civilized people. For in a world where the rights of the weak and the honor of the pledged word can be overruled by the high hand of military power, there is no tolerable life for nations or for peoples. So in spite of our hatred of war, we must meet force with force. And as our children move from the crowded cities to the kind care of newfound friends in safer places, what a tragic contrast to the preparations for the horrible struggle that may lie ahead. Fearing the worst, the British government distributed 38 million gas masks to regional centers over the next few weeks in anticipation of a possible gas attack during air raids. As the Nazis marched across Europe, they invaded France, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, with Holland and Belgium surrendering in May 1940. 
The Nazis won Paris as Norway surrendered and France fell to Germany. The potential attacks on Britain were real and looming. In August 1940, Nazi Germany launched a bombing offensive against airfields, factories and other strategic targets in Britain. The first air raid to hit central London began on August 23, 1940. The British government also issued a warning that people must go to the nearest air raid shelter during bombing attacks. If poison gas has been used, you will be warned by the means of hand rattles. If you hear hand rattles, do not leave your shelter until the poison gas has been cleared away. Hand bells will tell you when there is no longer any danger from poison gas. Back then, adult gas masks were black. They also designed a gas mask especially for children. The red rubber pieces and bright eye pizza rooms, which quickly became known as a Mickey Mouse gas mask. The design uses bright colors along with the floppy nose element that served only as a decorative device to add character to the mask. It looked nothing like Mickey Mouse, but as it was explained in a note from the Disney London office, the name was given to it by air raid wardens and others who had the job of fitting them on small children, and the name Mickey Mouse was used to alleviate the fears of any of these tiny tots who might be frightened at the sight of a gas mask. The Disney note was relayed by T.S. Smith, the owner and general manager of the Sun Rubber Company of Ohio, to Major General William N. Porter, Chief of Chemical Warfare at the War Department in Washington, D.C. It was part of discussion of manufacturing gas masks, including ones for children, for distribution to civilians in the United States. December 7th, 1941. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, with massive force that destroyed the battleships of the Pacific Fleet. In the days of early 1942, the US government was faced with the possibility of defeat and a dark future for its citizens. Their military was fighting a losing battle on all fronts and fears of another attack were high. A critical need existed to protect the civilian population, especially children, from gas attacks. Hawaii was of special concern since an attack has already taken place there. It was decided that thousands of US military training masks were to be distributed to the population. No masks were available to protect children because of their small stature. So the Hawaiian department used a locally fabricated expedient that consisted of a hood with bunny ears. On January 7, 1942, one month after Pearl Harbor, T.W. Smith Jr., the owner of Sun Rubber Company and his designer Dietrich Rampel, with Walt Disney's approval, introduced a protective mask for children. With large glass eyes, a snout and big round ears, the mask was shaped like Disney's signature character, Mickey Mouse. It took just 30 days to design and make the first prototype of the mask. This model of the Mickey Mouse gas mask was presented to Major General William N. Porter, Chief of the Chemical Warfare Service. Even Walt Disney himself came to Washington and met with the civil defense and chemical warfare officials. Disney wanted to check the progress of the gas mask he had designed. After approval of the CWS, Sun Rubber Products Company, went to produce a little over 1000 units. Other comic book character designs were to follow, depending on the success of the Mickey Mouse mask. There was a Pluto mask sketched and the Three Little Pigs gas mask prototype created. Neither was ever mass produced, but they did appear in PIC magazine. The article goes as follows. The exterior of the mask is designed by Walt Disney. During these raids, children will be persuaded to regard the whole thing as a game. Instead of mobs of morbid screaming children, we shall have giggling, happy youngsters, blessedly unaware of the poison atmosphere which lurks outside their gas masks. The mask was meant to calm terrified children and designed so children would carry it and wear it as a part of a game. This would reduce the fear associated with wearing gas masks and hopefully improve their wear time and hence survivability. As horrible as that may sound, it might not be so different to the harsh reality of children having to do active shooter drills today. But can you imagine a classroom of 20 or 30 children all wearing that mask, running around screaming? The youngsters in DC were encouraged to go through their houses looking for scrap to donate. Attire, it was noted, could make 12 gas masks. 
An official said they will feel pride in the fact that they are playing the part of volunteers behind the lines and that they are helping to defeat our country's enemies. The protection of children was a primary concern of all nations during World War II. Germany had a child gas protective group for infants. Very few of the Mickey Mouse gas masks survived. The U.S. Army Chemical Museum at Fort McLennan, Alabama, has a handmade prototype. The 45th Infantry Division Museum, Oklahoma City, has a production specimen on permanent display with other gas masks in a combat support area of the museum. The Walt Disney Archives, Burbank, California, has a face piece without ears, lenses or a canister. And a mask owned by the founder of the Sun Rubber Company was on display at the Summit County, Ohio Historical Society's exhibit in 1982. Rumors spread that the first consignment of gas masks due to be delivered the following week would be far from adequate and it was a question of distribution. Whoever got there first would be lucky. It turned out to be true and several weeks later there was a mad panic for these frightfully looking things at local school rooms where they were being distributed. People reacted in the most uncivilized way because they were so certain that poison gas would be used by the Germans and there were not enough gas masks issued on the first delivery for everyone to feel safe. To get used to the experience, people were encouraged to wear gas masks for 50 minutes a day. Authorities threatened to punish people for not carrying gas masks. Government advertisements appeared in newspapers, pleading with people to take their gas masks with them at all times, and posters were published that said, Hitler will send no warning, so always carry your gas mask. However, legislation was never passed to make it illegal. Teachers were instructed to send children back home to fetch their masks if they had forgotten them. Entry was occasionally refused to restaurants and places of entertainment to civilians who were without their survival kit, and even some store owners demanded their staff to always have their war equipment in reach. Gas masks were neither easy nor comfortable to wear. The gas-like odor of rubber and disinfectant made many people feel sick. One child wrote, Although I could breathe in it, it felt as if I couldn't. It didn't seem possible that enough air was coming through the filter. The covering over my face, the cloudy perspex in front of my eyes, and the overpowering smell of rubber made me feel slightly panicky. And though I still laughed each time I breathed out, and the edges of the mask blew a gentle raspberry against my cheeks. The moment you put it on, the window misted up, blinding you. Our mouths were told to rub soap on the inside of the window to prevent this. It made it harder to see than ever, and you got soap in your eyes. There was a rubber washer under the chin that flipped up and hit you every time you breathed in. The bottom of the mask soon filled up with spit, and our face got so hot and sweaty you could have screamed. A study at the beginning of war suggested that only 75% of people in London were obeying government instructions regarding gas masks. By the beginning of 1940, almost no one bothered to carry them. The government now announced that air raid wardens would be carrying out monthly inspections of gas masks. If a person was found to have lost the gas mask, they were forced to pay for its replacement. Once there was a gas leak from a building, and witnesses described that the very few masks were visible, except soldiers and an odd child. People described the mood that government was creating as strange. All sorts of emergency measures were being taken by the government to prepare the people for war. Thousands lined up patiently to be measured for gas masks, only to find out that the masks were manufactured so hastily that a huge mistake was made. A life-threatening one. The parts which were supposed to intercept gas had been accidentally left out. Furthermore, trenches were dug in Hyde Park, causing mass discontent on the part of nannies who complained that the little children they were taking care of were always falling in. Apart from some bitter jokes, the atmosphere was, as a whole, one of a calm before the storm, an apathic bowing to the inevitable. As soon as he gained power in 1940, Winston Churchill considered using chemical weapons. He changed his mind when informed by military intelligence that Germany was capable of dropping three or four times more chemical bombs than Britain. 
However, plans were put in place to use gas warfare if Adolf Hitler ordered an invasion of Britain. In 1943, when it became clear that Germany's ability to drop chemical weapons on Britain had declined, Churchill began again to consider the use of poison gas against Germany. The cabinet agreed that if the Germans used gas against the Soviet Union, then Britain would retaliate by drenching the German cities with gas on the largest scale possible. Thankfully, both sides did not use chemical weapons during the war. But a few years later, authorities began to have worries about the British gas masks that were produced. You know, sometimes hastily developed technology turns out to be immensely effective, but other times it can backfire, putting the user in as much or even greater danger from which it is supposed to be protecting them. One such example was the British civilian gas mask of the Second World War. While the masks were effective in terms of being able to filter out poisonous gases, the filters in them contained a chemical that we now know is extremely harmful to humans, asbestos. Asbestos, which was widely used as a heat resistance insulator before it was discovered just how harmful prolonged exposure was. Local doctors noticed factory workers that had been employed in making the masks were showing abnormally high numbers of deaths from cancer. It was pointed out that the gas mask contained chrysotile white asbestos or chrysotilite blue asbestos in their filters. Asbestos does not present a health risk if it's undisturbed, but if material containing it is chipped, drilled, broken, cut through or allowed to deteriorate, it can release a fine dust that contains asbestos fibers that consist of very sharp microscopic crystals. This dust can stay in the air for days before settling, providing a danger to the entire area it was released in. One report suggested that working in gas mask factories resulted in the death of 10% of the workforce due to pleural and peritoneal mesothelioma. And this type of cancer develops years after the asbestos fibers are inhaled. First, the fibers cross through the chest cavity and once through, they can enter the peritoneum. If the fibers lodge themselves into this lining, they can incite an inflammatory reaction. Over time, there is a change in the DNA of cells and, as a result, tumors develop. Another lethal disease is asbestosis. While your body is in the process of constantly fighting the sharp foreign bodies, the asbestos fibers inside you, scarring you curse on the lungs. Eventually, your lung tissue becomes so stiff that it can't contract and expand normally. Symptoms include shortness of breath, a persistent cough, wheezing, fatigue and chest pain. Usually the delay between first exposure to asbestos and the onset of disease is long and can vary from 15 to 60 years. Developing this kind of health problems was three times more likely than a normal incidence of lung or respiratory cancers in factory workers. There is no cure for asbestos-related diseases. Asbestos is a fibrous, naturally occurring mineral that from the late 19th century was used extensively in various construction materials. It was popular because of the material's unparalleled fireproofing and insulating capabilities. It even possesses other attractive qualities. It is relatively lightweight, abundant, cheap to mine and process, resistant to water and acids, durable to the point of indestructibility, electrically non-conductive and unattractive to vermin. It was woven into fabric and even used to insulate buildings, meaning it can be put to an enormous number of uses. Not surprisingly, it came to be viewed for the first two-thirds of the 20th century as the indispensable and even the magic mineral. Although asbestos was officially banned outright from the UK in 1999, many employers today still fail to provide safe working environments with that material still present. In fact, between 2002 and 2010, 128 British school teachers died from mesothelioma. 75% of schools in the UK contain asbestos. 
and due to recent education budget cuts, it's likely that buildings in need of proper maintenance are not going to be taken care of so soon. Additionally, demolishing those kind of buildings will release the dangerous fiber-filled asbestos dust into the air, making the highly needed renovations even more difficult. It is estimated that about 2,500 UK citizens die each year from illnesses contracted by asbestos exposure. However, the government decided to not tell the British public about the possible dangers of wearing gas masks during the war, fearing, no doubt, a large number of compensation claims. It was a story that appeared in the Lancashire Telegraph in August 2013 that suggested that gas masks posed a serious health danger. Doris Timbrell died of esophageal cancer in November 2008. Her daughter, Patricia Nicholas, claimed that this was connected to her working at Baxter's of Blackburn between 1941 and 1933 assembling gas masks and fitting filters. A compensation claim was launched against the Ministry of Defence and eventually she won nearly £48,000 in damages. In the following year the Health and Safety Executive says it analyzed a number of vintage gas masks at the request of the Department of Education. According to BBC, schools were now being warned about the use of gas masks in the classroom. The analysis showed that the majority of masks did contain asbestos, often the more dangerous suicidalite or blue asbestos. Schools with these items in their collections are advised to remove them from use, double bag them and send them for license disposal or to be made safe by licensed contractors or arrange to have them displayed in a sealed cabinet. As early as 1912, the British government was being warned about the health dangers of working with asbestos. Six years later, the United States acknowledged the danger. In 1924, the first case of asbestos-related death was recorded, involving Nellie Kershaw, who had worked in the spinning room of a Rockdale asbestos factory. Ironically, it was German scientists in the late 1930s who first raised the possibility of asbestos-related cancer. In fact, the Germans were so convinced of the dangerous aspects of that material that they made diseases related to it compensable, something that did not happen in the case of Nellie Kershaw. She couldn't work anymore because of her illness, but her employer never gave her any compensation. In their minds, Doing so would create a precedence and admit responsibility, leading to possible more workers to come out about their declining health because of work conditions. Nellie died from asbestos poisoning at the early age of 33. In 1965, scientists finally confirmed the link between asbestos inhalation and cancer, now referred to as earlier mentioned mesothelioma. But still, Many workplaces continued to expose the workers to asbestos through the 1970s. Another case in which saving human life doesn't seem to matter at all in comparison to saving money. But which one of the two options exactly is the lesser evil? Dying from inhaling toxic and cheap materials used for the gas masks by your own government meant to protect you? or being left defenseless while suffocating during a chemical attack. Every war in human history has people experience terrible fears and fates. The Mickey Mouse gas masks were only a small chapter of the bizarre outcomes of war. Thankfully, they never had to be actively used and they remain a weird tale to tell for us later generations. And while chemical weaponry was not used in World War II, the same thing unfortunately can't be said about the First World War. It brought a whole different kind of horror into this world. But those are stories for another time. <laughs> oh boy!